We're talking this morning with Charles H. Hapgood, that's H-A-P-G-O-D, author of the book entitled Earth Shifting Crust. And uh, we have Ellery Lamb there with us, fact editor of Fantastic Science Fiction. I don't know how he's going to have a fact editor in <laughs> <laughs> Science Magazine, but... Well, he's he probably he's right, right, period on the others, you know, don't get too long. That is, that is with us, he's Robert and Dickens, Robert E. Sanderson, Zoologist, and Dave Bell. On the one hand, you're, uh, um, you have to, the disappearance of a great continent, the uh, ice capping off the night, it's a warming of square miles. If you're going to enough that, uh, you have to assume a very, uh, a world of action for And there's only one thing they could account for of melting one ice cap and going to bring out to the sea, and that would be very, uh, about the only reasonable one we could think of would be a ship. Gentlemen, I have a couple of more telegrams here. This is one from Pete McLaughlin, Copy Garden, Quakertown, Pennsylvania. I don't think he's listening to me. I think he's listening to Big Joe's Happiness Exchange because he says, I think you're real hot tonight. <laughs> We're talking about <laughs> Here's another telegram. This is for you, uh, Mr. Hapgood. Please ask Mr. Hapgood to comment on hydrogen bombs in Arctic ice, possibly to inundate our Atlantic seaboard. This is from Emil Osman of Lindhurst, New Jersey. Well, one of the square uh, <coughs> questions part is um, how, in case uh, the Antarctic ice cap is threatening uh, us with a new ship to the crust, which would be quite like the first draft of civilization, uh, what should we do about it? And Mr. Brown, who's uh, suggested this was in the first place, uh, mm -hmm. was suggested that perhaps with uh, nuclear power, we might be able to melt the Antarctic ice cap and, there and thereby prevent uh, its, uh, its cataclysm from happening. So, uh, he devoted a very lot of time to it, and that was some time to it, too, but uh, it's a, a very intricate question, because this ice cap covers six million square miles. To melt it would require quite a lot of atomic bombs, and the question is, wouldn't they so poison the air that uh, we would all be exterminated by the radioactive bombs, you see? So we would have to find some way of using the nuclear power to control the ice cap, or melt it in the right places, uh, without poisoning uh, the population of the Earth. That's a problem for somebody else. I, I don't know. I have the, the president of uh, <coughs> uh, the National Security Council, perhaps, might find a solution to that. We're talking this morning with Charles H. Hapgood. That's H-A-P. G-O-D, author of the book entitled Earth Shifting Crust. And uh, we have Ellery Lamb there with us, fact editor of Fantastic Science Fiction. I don't know how he's going to have a fact editor in <laughs> 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 magazine, but well, he's, I know he's probably gonna... right, right, heard on the others, you know, <laughs> don't get too long. <laughs> that, is, that is with us, he's Robert and Robert E. Sanderson, Zoologist, and Dave Bell. Ellery Lanier? Um, Mr. Hatz, Charles, I have a small global bone to pick with you on your theories, which I, I admire your theories very much. I think they're quite important, and I, I think your book is an important book. The United States has had such a disastrous earthquake. We've had a San Francisco earthquake, which is very destructive, and... Uh, it's my personal opinion that some of these theories, as you outlined in this book, may help us to understand the nature of earthquakes and uh, prevent these tremendous disasters that have occurred at times. The bone I have to pick with you is uh, your reference to a certain, uh, I don't know if he's a theologist, he's saying the name of Bergquist, who you refer to in your text. And for the record, I want to, I think, uh, I was talking to one book where you say that uh, since truth cannot be suppressed forever, and they have to show, uh, to explain why this theory should be expounded, even though there are 
are not awake and you know, want to stay in the house and they're still living with their beggars and so on. Birth uh, with notion of a collision of the earth with a small planetoid that is John. And I think that uh, John is extremely important. Uh, I don't know whether John really exists or whether John doesn't exist. I do not know. But in any case, what is the story? John, John was, in effect, the second most important planet in the solar system in the Earth. And without the influence of John, life would never have come about on Earth. Uh, Neil Brooks, who refers to the theory of the moon coming out of the Pacific, and who uh, states that the argument has been written away, I'm not supposed to see the point of view which has gone away so easily, because according to Brooks, it was the acceleration uh, of the Earth's spin caused by John's massive into the Earth that caused the Earth to, to uh, speed up and bulge out of the equator and give birth to the moon. And in the process, uh, how very important the fact is the emergence of man and the eventual man. Uh, this, my reference to the planet, John, is for the record. I don't think it should be forgotten. I think you should know about John. But I, I would like very much to know why you the John so fast. Well, uh, of course, I brought in uh, Burgess. Uh, on purpose, because I didn't want to have the distraction. On the one hand, uh, he's got me to be along the line that I was following. On the other hand, I thought it was rather interesting. I thought it was your theory. I found in the writing version that you had a similar thought. Uh, yes, uh, that he felt that a uh, that uh, could have caused a movement to be a thrust. Uh, that it might have caused such a move to be placed into the cross. And then he, I think, also, he even argues that the North Pole has been really a place to lay out of the fair balance of people. And that they just look like they take the case of God's North Pole. I think that's a major collision. It's not with John, at least with George, or some other uh, uh, planet or planet uh, does. I have a question with John. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you, John. Well, it's the same place. I mean, we see it soon. I know that, now, Dr. Urey, you see, Dr. Urey, it's about something of the same, you know, uh, line of thought. You spoke on the planet, uh, the origin, uh, the origin of the planet. You spoke of Urey, uh, how of Urey. And he brought up the idea that, uh, but the moon surface is uh, the result of many collisions with large uh, planetoids. And that uh, um, these uh, high mountains uh, are there uh, because uh, they were created by the collision. And that uh, they are not doing any. Yeah, they are in much of the moon. They are in much of the moon. They But uh, you are in that they were mom, and I didn't even have uh, any uh, religion created, not an existing form, uh, but that, but, you saw evidence, in uh, the water, once they had been on the water, a lot of times they don't get now, and that's the other thing, the big uh, road, uh, those mountains. But the, um, Incidentally, with regard to that, uh, you're as well with the same idea. Uh, it sounds a lot of interesting talk. It was this, that uh, we see that, that uh, Mars, the surface of Mars now is smooth. And there's been no mountains to make. And it's been so that these are mountains where it's half the road to the west. And that's the surface of Mars and the surface of Mars is smooth. And at the same time, uh, Mars has only a small amount of moisture. We only have moisture on Mars for a few about two feet thick. Now, um, in this book, uh, I've been arguing with Campbell, my collaborator, worked out much 
from the scene. So the mountains are the only resulting from the space of the cloud. So we try to trace the whole of the mountains almost entirely from the a large number of the spaces of the cloud. But of course, the cloud was the spaces of these mountains to the ice cap. There was no ice cap, there'd be no space up on the mountains. Now, on Mars, you see no ice cap and no mountains. Well, I'm sorry to interrupt at this time, but we're going to take a moment to talk about the Niagara Cyclone Massage Unit. And now back with our guest, Ellery Lanier, who is the fact editor of Fantastic Science Fiction, has been talking about Professor... Berkwist and his theory. I was just wondering, uh, Ellery, if you want to continue, would you care to add something, tell us more something about this moon or the dinosaurs? I don't know what it was all about, but evidently it's Professor Berkwist's theory, and possibly you agree with it. It would be possible to prove Berkwist's theory if when our uh, rockets arrive on the moon, and some digging is done, skeletons of dinosaurs will be dug up on the moon's surface. This would prove that the theory of they survived the trip? Well, the question is, some of them may have survived, the skeletons may have been trapped, and somehow you may have uh, gotten through. Well, we might, of course, on the other hand, uh, we might, uh, we might, the skeletons, we might be able to find that there's really quite a different story that with the dinosaurs that uh, haven't been dropped off there on the way from some other planet, you know. Well, that is continuing. I would like to ask if I have a question to my death now, if uh, the whole of southern Sweden is made of comic stone. I don't think so. I think uh, this is <laughs> the Berkowitz theory is that uh, when the moon was uh, ripped off the... Yeah, uh, no, I got the theory. Uh, Excuse me, but... Uh, various bits and spatters and... Much as of this ripped off moon fell back, didn't yeah, fell but along. Yeah, the best of our knowledge, the surface of the moon is made of pumice stone. And uh, therefore, the bits of it fell back in southern Sweden. The whole of uh, southern Sweden must be made of pumice stone. And also, I'd like to know what happened to the skin of the earth, which must have gone off with the blob, went to the moon, because the, the, the surface yes. of, the, of the, uh, the underneath of the Pacific is made of exactly the same stuff as the surface of all the continents and the surface of the underneath of all the other oceans. So if somebody ripped a huge great hunk out of one side of the globe and sent it sailing out into the sky, it must have taken some of the skin with it. Where did all this new skin come from? Exactly. Uh, Berkowitz uh, holds, and uh, I, I, I don't know whether I'm not holding for Berkowitz, I'm just uh, presenting his uh, theory. That uh, there are these, the, uh, what he calls the CO and the CIOM. Uh, you know the pronunciation better than I. I knew of that, yes, 20 years and, ago. Uh, yes. And that the uh, fact is that the surface skin of the earth that is prevalent all over the world is not present in the, in the basin of the Pacific Ocean, according to Berkowitz. Well, according to him, but according to uh, uh, Professor Henry and all of us mentioned the findings of the uh, Task Force 43 and the Antarctic Expedition and the worldwide surveys of. Uh, with the Dutchman Van Lazing, I never can pronounce his name, um, that it is yes, the same okay. all over the bottom of the uh, of the Pacific. Uh, the old idea of CL and CMAR is gone completely, and they have discovered now that they used to I, think I that I the know, bottom of the ocean yeah, yeah. was covered by a silicon magnesium rock, and that the, uh, the continents were made of silicon aluminum, for the most part, rock. So they found that it is not so. Now, when they've taken these core borings and all over the Pacific, not all over, but uh, very extensively, they have never yet found any place where there is not the sea owl, the sea owl as well as the sea mar. Uh, there's a preponderance of uh, basaltic outflows, that's basalt, that stuff comes down yeah. below, but uh, there is no difference. Now, this theory that, that Mr. Quist, or whatever his name is, has, uh, is the theory of Sir Charles Darwin, not, not uh, the original Charles Darwin, but his son, I think I'm right. Mm-hmm. No, no, George. Uh, George, George, I think it's yeah. yeah. Is that not right, Charles? George Darwin, yes. He tried to develop the theory of, of the moon having originated from the Pacific. Yeah, the... Uh, <laughs> I think it will there, be a there are, there are it's proven it's so nice. It's been very happy to be proven. <laughs> well, there is there been a number of, say, of objections to this uh, advance by geophysicists. Um, in recent years, Gutenberg, you know, uh, Gutenberg, as you've answered a good many, uh, in a book of 
of his, from the internal constitution of the earth. But uh, my, my feeling is then that one such thing as the uh, one great event, such as dripping out uh, the moon out of the Pacific, is not a good enough explanation for the uh, all the things that have happened through the whole history of the earth. It's putting too much, you see, upon this one hypothetical event, or putting too much of a burden on one hypothetical event. It also seems almost impossible to conceive of such a thing as that occurring and still leaving the dinosaurs or any other mammals there on the face of the earth. But you think of the, of the meteorological effect of uh, ripping out of kind of out of the Pacific in that way. The possibility of uh, any life remaining on the face of the earth in those circumstances would be almost uh, out of the question. It seems too much. It's too much to... to uh, it seems an improbable thing. Now, I don't say it's not true, and I don't say it's impossible, but I say it's, it seems improbable, and that it can't... It isn't enough but to explain uh, the innumerable things that uh, have happened to... Uh, more than two billion years that we know of in their history. But let me ask them something. For example, just a moment, just about yeah. that matter of the Ice Ages. Now, you can't explain Ice Ages from the Precambrian to uh, the shift due to either vertical collisions or to uh, the uh, creation of the Pacific. Uh, we also know, for example, uh, some of the Soviets, uh, the many expeditions in the Arctic. So, shown in recent years by the, uh, that uh, the whole Arctic Ocean has originated since the Mesozoic period. That is, it's, uh, it, it actually, uh, the whole um, uh, at Arctic Ocean is a, is a recent development. Now, nothing was ripped out of the Arctic Ocean. We have to account for the creation of the Arctic Ocean in some other way. It's a recent development on the Earth's surface, and it has to be explained, but it can't be explained by ripping out a moon, because we already have a moon, you see, and we can't rip out a moon from the Pacific, and so on. So, um, in other words, there's too much to be explained, uh, and we can't put it all on just one moon, not one ocean. Well, this great idea of the difference between an ocean and uh, the absence of an ocean, um, the oceans are on average two and a half miles deep, and two and a half miles... Out of 40 miles from the crust alone is absolutely nothing. And now we're beginning to find that the, uh, the surface of the bottom of the ocean is covered with the same stuff as the land. Uh, we are also beginning to find that whole sections of the bottom of the ocean rise up in a matter of hours. I don't know if you know the case uh, which was quoted by Spence, the famous expert, and he was an expert on, on uh, Atlantis. As a matter of fact, he lost his whole reputation. I don't know if it's Charles of Lyon. Um, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. in, in a book, uh, John, um, about Atlantis, uh, Herbert Spence, what makes it possible? He, he started uh, very based on that his whole conclusions on one thing. That was the sudden splitting of the cable between Cape Town, South Africa, and St. Helena. Um, and that's when he stated that when the cable ship had been sent there, they fish up the cable from one end until they come to the brain, they found that the ocean bottom had risen one and three-quarter miles overnight. And he published this statement, and he was called, immediately called on it. And he had got it from a clipping sent to him by a perfectly reputable scientist from an American newspaper, and they could never trace it. It just so happened that I spent two years uh, digging back, and we did finally find it in a perfectly reliable publication by the name of Zodiac, which is the uh, house organ, the technical house organ of what used to be the Eastern Union, not Western Union, the Eastern Union. And in this, uh, in this publication, there is a definite statement uh, as to what exactly happened. And I think it's a very significant to Charles's theory and also to Ellery's uh, remarks here. There, the British Admiralty had surveyed the area on the way to, to South Africa from the island of St. Helena. In, I, and as you know, after the use of some stage, uh, let us say in 1900. And they had found that the ocean bottom there was uh, two and a half miles deep. 
uh, just about what it was throughout that, uh, that area. And they had laid the cable uh, with that understanding. And the cable had worked for a considerable number of years. And then all of a sudden, it broke. And they sent the cable ship, the name of it, as a matter of fact, was the Britannia. And she fished it up and took soundings at the same time and found that a strip of ocean bottom, 200 and some odd miles long, and it's at the widest point, 25 miles wide, and its narrowest point, 10 miles wide, had risen one and three quarter miles, uh, more or less, apparently, overnight. Now, the, speed, the average of the ocean bottom is only two and a half miles. <laughs> They've only got about a mile to go. They can come up a mile and, more than a mile in one night. Ocean bottom, which is only a mile deep, could suddenly appear as land. Therefore, the actual difference between an ocean and the absence of an ocean is not really as great as we previously thought. Now that we know that the, the skin of the earth goes down underneath another again. Mm -hmm. I think you might be interested in this. I was just talking to Al Nielsen, our engineer, and Al told me that this afternoon he was reading his National Geographic, dated to February 1958. And there's an article in there about this theory of the possibility of the moon uh, having been a part of this planet. Now, if this theory has been exploded, why would it be in what uh, I imagine could be considered a fairly current edition of National Geographic? Well, the, well, the theory can go on forever, John. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I agree like that. But in other so, words, if it's completely exploded, in other words, that, that there's, there's nothing to this, so, why would a publication like National uh, Geographic uh, print it? Well, but what did it say, John? Do you know? Uh, what well, it, 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 yes, it's discussed. I haven't read it. Al Nielsen, I Yeah, well, I mean, uh, read it. Yes. The, the article might have said that uh, they might be simply discussing a theory which was at one time put forward without saying that they agree with it. Mm. Or that it oh, I, I don't. I, I have evidence it. for it. Or mm. it I, I don't it. mean to imply that National Geographic that behind this idea. Come out for the idea. No, I don't think that could happen. No, uh, but the explanation, I think one thing we should say, uh, with regard to things like that, um, there's a tremendous lag, very, very slow uh, process of circulation of, uh, of data on our uh, theories through. Uh, uh, so that some of the old theories last for a terrible long time. Now, for example, uh, one of the most interesting things that I discovered when we began this work was I found that um, there was a change in the uh, theory of the origin of the Earth and that this theory originally we saw of it as being originally a molten mass that was cooled off and solidified as we saw it as the uh, nebula theory of the Earth's origin and that had been universally accepted down to about 30 years ago. Now then, about 30 years ago, in fact, about 1900, or after that, Chamberlain and Southwind, uh, of it developed the planetesimal theory. And from that time on, it became more and more obvious that this nebula theory wouldn't work, and that the moon that the Earth had never been motion. About 30 years ago, with that, uh, most of the geologists, many geologists, uh, had unanimously accepted this. Had, uh, had, not unanimously, several of them, and many of them had. And then, um, by ten years or so, the majority of the geophysicians had given up the idea. But, uh, George Gamow, the biographer of the Earth, published just a few years ago, reproduced the same idea of a uh, remote knowledge of the Earth, and without even suggesting the possibility of this, that it ever had been questioned. And today you will find many geologists as well as the general public who will hold their own theory, although really it was exploded at least thirty years ago. You mean the, the nebula? Yeah. And then you'll see about this the matter of the moon coming out of the Pacific. <laughs> one other piece of evidence that is rather important to hear is that um, in the last ten years we've discovered hundreds of sea mounts on the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. These are, are flat top mountains that rise from the bottom of the Pacific and are cut off at uh, different distances uh, below the surface. Some of them rise to within half a mile of the surface, some of them right within a few or four miles of the surface. But they have been dated um, back, some of them obviously belong to the Precambrian, 
And obviously, uh, you can't have uh, some of those seamounts uh, dated much, much farther back than the uh, origin of the moon by the vertebrates there. We're talking this morning with Charles H. Hapgood. That's H-A-P-G-O-O-D. Ellery Lanier, fact editor of Fantastic Science Fiction, is with us. Ben is with the cybernetician. Ivan T. Sanderson, zoologist, and Dave Bell. Mr. Hapgood is the author of the book entitled Earth's Shifting Crust. Dave Bell? The theory that the moon came from the bottom of the Pacific while having been rejected by a number of scientists, nevertheless hasn't been completely exploded. The fact that the uh, bottom of the Pacific is still the same material as the remainder of the crust of the Earth wouldn't rule out the idea entirely. Um... Consider this possibility that if the Earth's crust had split and that the molten core of the Earth were expelled into space, then the Earth's crust would settle back down and give a reasonably intact uh, surface to the bottom of a cavity which would then fill with water and become the Pacific Ocean. Because of this origin from the uh, molten core of the Earth, and because of the amount of pumice stone that we find present in lava, we can assume that possibly the molten core is constructed or made up of uh, materials very similar to pumice in a uh, molten state. This would account for the pumice stone on the surface of the moon, which is assumed to be there. I don't believe that the theory can be entirely ruled out if you keep in mind this possibility. Now, actually, the thing that I wanted to say earlier was something concerned about the National Geographic, but not concerning this theory. I didn't read the February issue. What I wanted to refer to was a, an earlier issue in which they had a complete picture story on the birth of an island, where they showed an island in various steps of being formed in the Pacific Ocean, having raised up from the uh, from the uh, bottom of the ocean. Ivan, I wonder if you remember having seen that article. What a goodie. You know, it's what a goodie. I'll stop him down about ten times. And <laughs> in history, as far as you know, he comes up and he's the Does anyone live on it? Hmm? No. People have done from time to time. There's a lot of big runner there. Uh, he was 400 foot high and 17 something, and then the uh, next time it wasn't there at all, then it was only 40 foot high, and then it was uh, 20, 200 foot deep, and it popped up again. And it's a fascinating story that was written up in the, uh, in the National Geographic some years about six years How long have people lived there when they did? Well, they come and go, you know. Um, transient. I don't think anybody's ever actually seen it go, uh, go up or go down. Mm -hmm. but, uh, in the early days, it's just uh, popping up and disappearing. And, you know, they were very bad with their charts in those days. And they thought they might have just missed it. Also, we missed Corsi about 40 miles from our wall, so we're on the map in the wrong place. Full of footy in the middle of the Pacific, you know, too much man. John, if I may take a moment, I, I think I can explode your, your theory. Um, one rather simple Not way. Not my theory. No, uh, um, Dave. Dave Bell. Uh, yeah, right. I explode my theory. Uh, no, no, I never. It's your show, John. I haven't. So far to run. May I correct you? It isn't my theory. No, but the one you were mentioning. Yeah. And I don't remember all the details about it. I was trying to recall them as I was yeah. going along, and I was having a little difficulty because of Ben heckling. Yeah. I wasn't heckling. You can't say you heard me heckling. <laughs> well, that's the chap who developed the theory. Uh, 
this, um, about this point. Uh, do you know any animal or any living thing on the surface of this earth that can live perpetually uh, below zero centigrade or above 100 degrees centigrade? If you say you don't, I'll tell you because I can tell you one that there are certain kinds of fly larvae that can live in water, which is actually boiling, and others which can live in pure gas. Uh, apart from that, on the whole, life has to be confined between um, freezing and boiling. Now, if you start sitting in the middle of the, what used to be what is now the Pacific open and uh, letting a lot of magma pour out of there uh, at a temperature of what? 4,000 centigrade or something? 4,000? Um, that's going to boil everything on the surface of the earth. And just uh, the amount of time to let the moon loose, like a sort of bursting boil out of the side of the, of the, the mother planet, would so heat up the surface of this planet that it must have destroyed the whole of life as we know it today. Now, there is no such destruction of life at any time during the complete geological record. It's gone on continuously. From the beginning, have to start with, with amino acids and build up to amoebas, to make it oversimplified, and end up with uh, people like us. Oh. Uh, but uh, uh, you can't kind just of sort of cut it all off with the dinosaurs and then have them all start again with dinosaurs. It starts right at the bottom. Now, so there is no, there is no complete clean cut in the history of the Earth in pre-Cambrian time. Now, if if this gentleman's theory is that the moon sort of squirted out of the center of the Earth prior to the beginning of life on the surface of Earth, or by in the beginning of the Cambrian times, that uh, is an entirely different matter. But uh, that brings us right back to the, the present theory, I think, is that we are a, a binary planet in the first place. Mm -hmm. We're twin planets, one big one and one little one. Uh, you had your centrifugal force there, and just like the Antarctic today, with a bigger lump on one side than on the other, uh, it finally broke, and you got a little one going around the big one, which is us, and as I see Charles is getting nervous, now, he's got something to say on that. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't want to have to, uh, I don't want to address you, but, uh, in this, because, but, um, that's a fascinating, uh, uh, theory on, on the planetary origin, so, so, uh, should be discussing that. But, uh, I just want, but, in this, uh, my main objection to the, um, where I thought of, uh, side step. The question of the origin of the moon in the Pacific is uh, really because it doesn't explain enough. It's because uh, we assume that that happened back in the uh, Mesozoic, let's say a few hundred million years ago. Uh, this will not explain what's happened on the Earth too. That time. Can't explain the um, case of the United States. It will not explain the ice cap in North America. It will explain the long time, the long time in the ice cap. It will explain all the mountain formations that have been going on, you see, in the last hundred years. In other words, it doesn't tell us enough. If it has, uh, whether it's right or whether it's wrong, it still doesn't explain. I would like to say one thing about this, um, uh, that I consider the most important point about this, say that we're trying to present in this book. Uh, uh, Mr. Campbell, the nine and a half hours, the chief thing is um, a, what we might call a general, it's a general ice hypothesis. It's intended to explain a great many different theories. <coughs> Douglas uh, theory will explain certain facts, the community theory explains certain facts, and so on. This is 710 on the dial, WOR Radio, New York City. This is the facts over here, and the point is where the facts over there. But you know, we're trying to make a pattern or explanation for, uh, that will connect about a hundred major, different major problems in the Earth, uh, this to the Earth, which is a generalized way of the Earth. I mean, so we're going to explain not only the entire ice ages and one polar climate, and the mountain, they're making the folded mountains, and block mountains, and volcanic mountains, and so forth. And the distribution of species, and the origin and shape of the continents, and uh, the cause of the heat of the earth, and uh, about 50 other problems. And of course, we're falling right into the danger of being accused of uh, presenting a gnostic in our plural. You know, the medicine 
that you have besides medicine that will, uh, that will cure everything, including uh, amputated foot and so on, um, you're a specialist. You're a medicinist. Well, no, this is a book really, well, we hope it's scientific. It still does say so much that we're exposed to that occupation. We're trying to cure everything. Because we've got to hear an answer to uh, perhaps or to so many different problems. You're referring to your book? Yeah. The Earth Shifting Cut. Yes. It's, um... <clears throat> the man who wrote the index of this book was uh, a fact of a fellow, and um, he believed in the thing quite thoroughly when he wrote it, when he wrote the index, and he used the index as a means of arguing for the theory. And one of the uh, items in the index uh, was thrust, uh, uh, displacement of, under this heading. You have practically a summary of the whole book, and this about 50 or 60 major, major uh, problems that are solved by this, this one, one theory. Uh, ben, you had a brief question there? Yeah, I, I would like to ask this, sir. Hapka, uh, uh, simplifying your, your theory sort of. The explanation for the ice agent is that the, the ice didn't roll down to meet us, but that the uh, North American continent shifted over into the, uh, into the uh, near the North Pole, and this, this, and this formed the great uh, hip, worm, and rungo glaciation? No, the different glaciations were formed by different displacements. In other words, if one structure this way, you have nine caps. Yeah, yeah. And here, I've moved again in another direction, you have an ice cap somewhere else. Yeah. Each of the major glaciations then was the result of the displacement of the crust, leaving a certain area out what, near our pole. Yeah, well, what about the uh, the so-called glaciated rocks that uh, strewn over the North American continent are these gigantic boulders in relatively non-rocky areas and, uh, say, a, a gigantic boulder or a certain kind of mineral that is just uh, hundreds of miles away from any deposit of this kind of mineral. And previous to this, the explanation has been that these gigantic boulders, I think there are quite a few of them all over our mountain, were brought down with the uh, with the glaciers uh, during the ice age. Is that the only explanation for why these tremendous rocks and boulders, which are completely unlike the mineral deposits around the surrounding countryside, who came down actually on in the uh, rocks that were torn up by the glaciers. <clears throat> yeah. How well, I mean, that's completely right. We, we uh, certainly uh, we don't question that. that <coughs> is, well, how would how would this happen that way? That is, the, the out of the ice cap, the ice cap grew in North America because America was moving toward the pole at the time. But uh, the ice cap itself, as it moves, big enough to move by gravity, of course, it it could uh, right, the glacial movement to face. This is precisely as the glacial geologists uh, have have stated it. We're talking this morning with Charles H. Hapgood. That's H A P G O O D, the author of the new book entitled Earth's Shifting Crust. Crust. I'm sorry might also add that I've had a number of letters during the week, some 15 or 16 letters from people who suggested that we should have Mr. Hapgood with us this morning, and I'm very happy that Ivan T. Sanderson was kind enough to ring. Ellery Landier is with us, fact editor of Fantastic Science Fiction, and if with Ivan T. Sanderson and Dave Bell. <coughs> Pardon me. Here's a telegram from R. Gladstone, Jamaica. It is my understanding that the latest theory concerning the moon and the earth involves the idea that both bodies are of independent planets revolving around a common center of gravity located somewhere in the earth. Kindly discuss this. This is from Carold, K E W R O L D, Carold R. Gladstone of Jamaica, New York. Don't you read it again, please? It is my understanding that the latest theory concerning the moon and the earth involves the idea that both bodies 
or of independent planets revolving around a common center of gravity located somewhere in the Earth. How can the Earth revolve around a center of gravity located within itself? Gentlemen, I am reading a telegram from Mr. Gladstone. Uh, well, the binary theory of this book, I didn't hear about the center of gravity being in the Earth, a, a common focal point. Yeah. If I say Yeah. It's a question of definition. No, it's a question of place. I mean, the yeah, common really focal really point around which the moon and the Earth revolve is somewhere between them. It's not in the Earth. It's the center of gravity of the whole system. Well, but the telegram speaking says... Oh, I uh, It is my understanding yeah. that the latest theory concerning the moon and the Earth involves the idea that both bodies are of independent planets revolving around a common center of gravity located somewhere in the Earth. In other words, if the, if the moon being smaller and if it should be so very much lighter uh, relative to the... Uh, that, that that point might be within the surface of the Earth. May I suggest this, gentlemen? There is a possibility that uh, this is, is certainly not clear at this moment, and we might hear from Mr. Gladstone in another few minutes. And if not, then we'll try to pick up this question again. I, I know that you're looking at something in the book there. Is there something you want to comment on? I don't know. Something is just the Ellery wants to comment on. Is Ellery? Yes, uh, there is an extremely fascinating uh, bit of material in Paul Capsule's book. Uh, before I read it, I just want to insert something into the record about the planet John that I neglected to mention before. I'm not through with John. But uh, according to Berkeley's theory, uh, John hit the Earth at 5.30 in the afternoon, approximately 60 million years ago. I just want that recorded for posterity. That's amazing. Yes, it was uh, between 5 and 6, but he assumes it was about 5.30 in the afternoon that John, uh, John hit the planet. That's like the Anglican uh, minister who, wants, uh, who figured out the, uh, that the Earth was created 4,004 years mm -hmm. ago on a Sunday morning at 10.30. Well, that was so that everyone can get the church in time. But, uh, May I ask at uh, 6 o'clock on what, what side of the earth? I once sent a telegram to my mother from Singapore, and it arrived the day before I sent well, it. Well, uh, very confusing. <laughs> it was on the equator going west to east, and it hit somewhere out in the lower part of the Pacific, I believe. This poor gentleman but, never um, heard, of, heard of the time uh, zone, did he? No, he hasn't, yeah. I don't think. <laughs> I, I want to quote uh, something that Charles wrote here, and I, want, I would like him to go into detail about a very interesting mechanism which is described in the book. And the quote here is, I was amazed and chagrined in this connection to note a phenomenon which, nevertheless, is as old as science itself. The professors, most of them at any rate, would not come to see the device. And I think, Charles, you know what device I am referring to. I, I would yeah. like you to describe that. Well, <clears throat> It was a device that was uh, uh, developed by Mr. Hugh Archenforce Brown, the man whose uh, idea of uh, specifically effective ice cap started me off on my work, you see, and what I was really trying to do. Uh, Mr. Brown uh, <coughs> developed uh, a device uh, which called a globe on trunnion. It was made to rotate in any direction feeling, you know, but to have uh, the book we have here with us tonight it is on a fixed axle. And it can't um, it can't rotate in any, in any direction field. Uh, but uh, Mr. Brown made this uh, device by mounting a globe on a timing. And then uh, which, uh, which would be a uh, a ring, a steel rim. Just a steel ring, a steel rim. He mounted that with two pebbles inside this, this, uh, this wheel, out of the wheel. Is so that something like a toy gyroscope, in a sense? Well, <clears throat> something like that. Yes. But then he took this device and cut it inside a larger ring on two uh, other pivots at right angles. Okay. So then it could be rotated either way, you see. You could push it in either direction. And he put that inside a third ring with two more pivots, and he had... 
then uh, a device that could be rotated in any way. And right away. Right. Again, again, at right angle. Now okay. that meant that um, you had a, then you had a globe which could move, well, could rotate freely in any direction, you say. And he, he suspended that to the ceiling with a, on a screen, and it was fixed so that you could wind it up with, with your finger, which you would wind it up the way you wind up the rope with the whole thing. The whole, the whole, the whole, whole thing. thing. And then let it go, and it would be set in motion by, you see, but, and with a, a, strong, a string unwound, uh, the uh, device was set in rotation. And it would have spin, and the other globe itself spin. would yes. spin. Now, the purpose of this was to test uh, the centrifugal effect that the ice caps would have. Um, there was this big controversy that started to bring to a college, and I got this idea because, of course, I didn't know anything about physics, I knew nothing about geology, I knew nothing about geophysics. If I had, I probably never would have started this at all. And, um, so, uh, my first question, uh, oh, did that, you say you would not have started the all, Charles? That's right. Uh, if I'd known anything about these, uh, if I'd known anything about these, uh, these fields, I would have considered, uh, the, uh, I would have known how many things were impossible. And consequently, I would have done nothing. Have you remembered something of Galileo in any sense? Well, as a matter of fact, Galileo had exactly the same experience as far as the uh, telescope. It's the, you know, the professor would not come to look through the telescope. You know? Yes, if I'm remembering that. Yeah. And this was uh, really uh, a repetition of history then. They wouldn't come to see the device. But the, uh, actually, uh, uh, the quarrel that started was over the question as to um, what uh, is the fact that this, what, what fact is this? It stabilizes the Earth on, its, on the axis of rotation. What is it that creates the stability of the rotation? You uh, what stabilizes the pole then on the face of the Earth? And but at that stage, we were not thinking about the shifting crust at all. Mr. Brown's theory did not, did not involve the shifting of the crust. It involved the capsizing of the Earth, the careening of the entire planet by the centrifugal effect of the ice cap. And, of course, Mr. Brown's idea was really quite fantastic, quite, uh, it was so, uh, it was really very fascinating, and although very, uh, most scientists would, uh, of course, have thought it uh, completely fantastic, uh, it, uh, still to us because we weren't. Well, so this is the stage that you communicated with Einstein over the before that. This is since then long, long before. Okay. And we had not gotten down to, that. Uh, we didn't get down to, uh, didn't get to, to the stage for Einstein Einstein until after Mr. Campbell had come into the picture as my collaborator and had done a, a good deal of work in mathematics and physics too. So I put this theory on on uh, well, solid base. But uh, this was at the earlier stage, we, this great kind of a fuss developed with the professors. This is about Springfield. Yes, and I must say, it's rather interesting from several points of view. Now, the... Um, I went to the professor for this, and I said, what is it? For stabilizing the earth on the, on the fact. Now, what Mr. Brown had said was that the earth is stabilized on the axis by the equatorial bulge. Now, the earth is, is not uh, exactly round, but it is slightly flattened with the pole. And it's slightly bulged with the equator. That's quite a few, but uh, none of you here except for me, I guess, but... We have uh, <laughs> the equatorial ball. Don't be so sure. You can't see. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, well, um, now this, according to Mr. Brown, this, uh, this, this extra mass around the Earth's center, the rotation of that by a kind of stereoscopic effect, you see, this stabilized the planet. And I wanted to make sure he was right. I went to the professor, there, uh, of physics. And he said, not at all. It's the um, momentum of the uh, rotation of the mass of the entire planet. The whole mass of the globe is made by the Gentlemen, I'm sorry to interrupt at this time, but I'm going to take, uh, oh, just a brief period of time to talk about Hudson vitamin products. Can I have a question? Yeah, I suppose it's come to it. Um, Supposing you have this uh, half-floating sphere representing the Earth inside... 
this Trunnion business, your three rings, which was right end. Could we start at the beginning? One of these rings is, let's say, horizontal. One is vertical, going from you, from me to you. We're sitting at opposite ends of the table. And the other one going from left to right. That's John the Leonard, right? Is that right? It sounds more like they're fixed. And then the ball inside is, is fluid, or it's, as it got... to get up to the equator, in other words. Isn't it? Yes. Having a spiral course to get there? No. Oh, moving straight. No, that's the thing that puzzles me most of all. No, it's uh, that um, thing. If you uh, fix the uh, uh, well be rotating and the, and the weight that... Uh, I mean, uh, the uh, you know that uh, that is... Uh, and slung around it, that it's being slung around it, you'll notice that that, that weight will be pulling out at right angle from the, the string. You see, from, yeah, from the... Now then, um, so the, the contributory part of the uh, rotating of the ice cap will be at right angle to the axis. axis. But it, in there, it will really actually put it out into space. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but there will be a tangential component of that. Was well, illustrated in one of Mr. Campbell's drawings in the book, a tangential component or part of that total force, which uh, will be parallel to the Earth's surface, which will be horizontal. And it will gravity pulling it in. Uh, which is tending to pull it moving down toward the equator. Yeah, that's your rectangle. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I am puzzled by the fact that you suspended the whole mechanism by a string and then twisted it on the string and let it un unspin itself on the string. Uh, it just seems to me that it would be a better method to put a little motor inside the uh, globe itself to give it a rotary movement or have some electrical device such as is used in the gyros uh, by the uh, marine gyroscopes. So that you actually your your mechanism was hanging by a string that gave it a controlled point of the force. Have you considered that question? Well, um, it's a request. Uh, Mr. Brown took it into the simplest way to get it to fast. It would be true that an internal motor might be good, but be very intricate and difficult thing to do and rather expensive. But this uh, this little simple uh, this is a very simple <laughs> device, and Mr. Brown was quite effective in in uh, showing uh, how a typical fact would move uh, uh, away, tend to move away on the on the other side of the equator. Of course, later I found that uh, this uh, this effect was very well established and generally known. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, George Gamow in the biography of the Earth talks about it. It's very well known. I mean, I found out that uh, wasn't at all. I was ignorant of that, but a great many geologists, geophysicists. Had been speculating about these reciprocal effects for a long time. They had not connected them with ice cap. But they had been thinking of these reciprocal effects in connection with other things. With the elevated uh, 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 mm -hmm. with mountain ranges in connection with continents. And so, uh, so the principle itself is quite well known, generally accepted one. Uh, Dave Bell? <clears throat> Mr. Hapgood, you mentioned the equatorial bulge a little while ago, and uh, you've been discussing that as the means of stabilization of the Earth's rotation. Uh, isn't the difference between the diameter at, uh, between the poles and the equatorial diameter about 25 miles? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I believe that's the figure that is given in the natural state. Oh, yeah. 26 miles and uh, more or less, yeah. Oh, you mean it's a little more accurate than the stat? Yeah. Over than the 25 miles. miles. Yeah, it's 26 point uh, something or other. I forget the exact figure. And this, would this then be sufficient to give a gyroscopic stability to the Earth's spin? Yes. And of course, that is just exactly the point. They raised all the difficulty in the 19th century about the series about Atlantis or about uh, smaller ships, you see. Because uh, now, yes. uh, that whole process is really quite fascinating to see. 
uh, how, uh, what happened in the 19th century uh, with regard to this question of shifting poles. And, of course, the questions of might have come into that, too. Because uh, uh, shortly after 1850, the growth of uh, geological knowledge revealed the fact that um, there had been a very warm, there had been uh, warm tempered forests and uh, corals and gold formations near the poles and so on. And, of course, the uh, paleontologists began to say, well, now, how are we going to explain this? And, of course, the ice age is the same thing when, when we had the great uh, ice caps uh, in India and in the Congo or on the, on the, on the crater itself in the Carboniferous period. So that um, right here we're going to talk about shifting of the poles. Now then, uh, but there were some uh, great authorities at the time who were extremely dogmatic and very definite about the fact that any shifting of the poles is totally impossible. Now the reason that they said that, see, was what Maxwell had shown, that the stability of the Earth depends upon the temperature above. Uh, Lord Kelvin and um, the George Darwin, the son of the great Charles Darwin, um, had um, argued that since the equatorial fog, you see, is uh, quite a massive thing, uh, then uh, naturally uh, the Earth, it's impossible to shift the Earth on its axis. You would have to make some other weight on the Earth's surface to equal to this 26 mile equatorial fog before you could uh, move the Earth on its axis. They, were, they did not think about shifting the Earth's crust. That, had, that idea did, was not entertained. They, was, they, they simply uh, pointed out, Sir uh, George Darwin pointed out, that the ship's proposal was to, uh, that to move the Earth on its axis, it couldn't be done without moving the equatorial ball. And as this is impossible, the idea of shifting the Earth on its poles was absolutely impossible, and that people who thought that uh, the arguments were the contrary to them, or dogmatic, or plants, or fools, and so on. And they just wouldn't. Uh, they were very dogmatic about it. And then these people had to, they were left with all these, you know, these uh, fossil corals in the Arctic Ocean, and um, on their hands, and wondering what to do with them. You see. They had to get some kind of a theory that would reconcile fossil corals with George Darwin and George Calvin. Um, there was a person by the name of but Fort. Uh, Charles Ford. Charles Ford, who uh, made a lot of fun of the of the people uh, that uh, uh, well of Lord Kelvin, and uh, he said Lord Kelvin and mm-hmm. Edith, and something not to their liking, it does not exist. <laughs> Mister uh, Hapgood. You just brought in the name Charles Fort, and frankly, I've been very, very reluctant to ask you this question, but I think I may at this time because you've mentioned Charles Fort. We talked with a lot of people on the party line. We're on for some 37 and a half hours a week, so uh, one can assume that we're going to talk with a lot of different people on different subjects. We had a gentleman on the party line who told us a story, and a lot of people laugh. They think that this is a joke. Maybe it is. I don't know. The gentleman told us something about a white lion in Ecuador. A white lion? Let me explain this to you first. Sir. It seems that <coughs> this gentleman claims that in Ecuador, there is a line that marks the line of the equator. And it seems that there is no gravitational pull at this, at this white line. So that if a person were to step on this white line, they would just zoom right off into space. Now, this has created such a tremendous amount of interest that Rand McNally, the map publisher, have had over 200 inquiries about this. A well-known columnist in Philadelphia for the Philadelphia Inquirer wrote an article 
I, I don't mean to imply that Mr. Cummins, the columnist uh, for the Philadelphia Inquirer, that uh, he went along with it, but he wrote an article about it, and he mentioned that it sounds like Charles Fort is involved in this in some manner. And although many people come on the program when we mention this, they laugh because it's a big joke, and other people are extremely serious about it. Have you ever heard about well, it? Well, John, perhaps you should give us a half an explanation for why there is no crisis. Why the gravitational spin effect? No, the, the, the spin of the Earth. Oh, yes. At, right, the, right, at right. the equator, right, the centrifugal right. force of the Earth counteracts the, the opposite attraction of the, of the Earth's gravity. So that the, at, on right on the and it's all concentrated at this point. Now on the gra on the equator itself, there is no gravity because these two forces are nullified. So therefore, anyone stepping on this line would be immediately swung out of the space. Nothing holding them down. There was a problem of how to get across that line of the tide. Well, they do it well, every time they say it, but across they they do a lot of things to them. I know uh, as rather violent things happen when you first cross the equator on a boat. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that was the connection of this to this in any way. I think there's a hypothetical connection between the two very definitely. Well, it's sort of a, a right to facade, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so I think there, there are continuations of the white line supposedly in, in somewhere in Borneo. Well, why is Borneo. it, Valerie, why is it that no one seems to be able to come up with a correct answer? Why is it that people talk about this, and, I, and I, I'm certainly not going to take credit for it on this program and say this is the first program that people heard about the white line that would be ridiculous, as possibly many people have discussed it. Why is it some people laugh and other people are very serious about it? Why can't we have some facts? How is it that a big concern like Rand McNally and Hammond and people like that uh, do not have sufficient knowledge about it, that they have to write to the people who who uh, talk about it on the party line. You know, let us know the geography of, uh, yes. of the, uh, of Rand McDowell. That's right. Of course, there's uh, one thing. I, I, I can't say anything about selection, uh, about this, about what the white line is, I and mean, what the experiences people have been on. I've never heard of this before. And I, uh, but I don't say uh, that uh, it is an error, I believe, to um, suggest that there is no gravity on the, um, on the equator. It's, um, that I think is definitely, uh, misunderstanding. It's right. We have right. Uh, on the equator with stuff, you have certain ways, uh, about, uh, a pound less, a uh, pound and a half less than he does at the, at the, at the, at the pole. But he, um, he still, up, uh, yes, the person, the person gains, he gains weight, he still toward the, um, toward the pole. So if you gain, uh, He's down at the South Pole, man who weighs 180 pounds at the equator, will weigh about 200, about, about uh, two, two pounds more. Two pounds more. Yeah, that's yeah. why one of the planes crashed down there, because it was an extra 40 or 50 pounds, or 150 pounds, or 500 pounds uh, increase in weight. They uh, calculated it at, uh, yeah, somewhere at about 30 degrees north, and when he got right bang smack on the Antarctic, the uh, South Pole, uh, she was still overloaded. The reason for that increase of weight is that um, we created this reciprocal effect of uh, their flotation at the pole, and that is so much closer to the center of the mass of the Earth. Uh, so that those things make... What, what is the volume? If you, supposing you put a perfect sphere inside the Earth at a good shape, uh, has anybody calculated the difference in volume between uh, the perfect sphere using the pole, the difference between the pole as the diameter, and um, the Earth as it actually is, the spheroid? What is the, is the, the, the extra mass we did due to this pole? We calculated that. But you see, uh, in making calculation, that was calculation that was completely useless. We, um, the map was, uh, of course, when we first started out, we didn't know anything at all, and we decided that, uh, we were going to try to measure the centrifugal stabilizing effect of the extra bars, and then we would measure the, uh, upsetting effects of the ice cap, and then we'll see which is larger than the other. So, um, 
Now, well, now, this was very complicated. The measuring the principle of the I kept very simple, because of the formulation in any textbook of physics. Very simple. But when it came to measuring the principle effect of the equator above, you see that that's a shell. Yes. And that's a shell. It differs in thickness with yeah, every inch of glass. That's what I mean. Yeah. Now, to get this, we required then in a calculus. Now, to get the formula, we finally, after about two years, we got the strategic engineering, the social geodetic survey, or the partial geodetic survey, to work out for us a calculus. In order to calculate the conceptual effect of the rotation of the equatorial above. It had never been done before? It never had been done before. But we had it done and we had the figures. But the figures, but when we got the figures, mm-hmm. and we had them, which would be the effect of the conceptual effect of rotation of the ice cap, of course, we found that the, um, the school got there completely because the stabilizing effect of the bulge was about 3,000 times the uh, upsetting effect of the ice cap. So it was at that point I got in my car and I got some answers from my, my old friend James Campbell. And I said, Jim, a terrible thing has happened. I've been working for three years on this day. I've got 116 students at college working on it. And we trust my own half scientists in the United States and England. And now they've blown up in our face and we haven't got a thing. And I explained that uh, mathematics is just full of and uh, And I was in despair because uh, we had dug up so much a lot of geological evidence that would support the shift of the Earth's crust. But our method of explaining this shift in crust, uh, I mean, uh, the, 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 that would explain the shifting poles. But we were not thinking of shifting the crust. We were thinking of the step cycle of a planet. And uh, it was, uh, Mr. Campbell uh, said, well, to drop a thing of the fact that perhaps the ice cap is, we uh, haven't got enough force to capsize the planet. But perhaps it does have enough force to move the crust. And at first, um, that was a sort of, well, that's a full water because, you know, moving the crust would be a slow and gradual thing. I had my imagination all stood up with these heads. Uh, the reappetizing of the planet all in half an hour, you know, with you know, terrific cataclysms, you know, ocean. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute, Joe. You know, with a whole continent and all that kind of thing. Wait a minute. Very exciting. All that. Do you not say in one of your chapters there that uh, when we come to the mammoth, uh, that um, cold front, uh, well, a whole combination of things can take place in a matter of hours or days? Well, <laughs> yes and yes. Um, there was a big problem, uh, one, of the, um, one of the very difficult problems to be worked out was how to explain what happened to the mammoth that uh, another animal that was find in the ice in, in Siberia. Now, that frozen mammoth so happened that... Um, in 1901, uh, they found one of the, of the frozen mammoths in Siberia that had been very perfectly preserved. And we had we, uh, a good many things found. Mammoths, uh, rhinoceroses, uh, saber-toothed tigers, or saber-toothed cats. Excuse me, I have a nice fight with all of them. No, only saber tooth cats did exist, or have did exist. Well, what is the dimension of what, what they call? Is that the difference is between a tiger and a and cat, and uh, that difference is much more than the difference between a Democrat and a Republican. You mean the mean these gigantic things were not tigers? They no. had stripes? How do you know they had stripes? That's true. How do I know they had stripes? <laughs> and uh, what's the difference between a cat, uh, um, what's the difference between a tiger and a lion, anyhow? In it. Uh, I can give you the body of each one. <laughs> <laughs> the professor, uh, Dr. Prokop, couldn't find the difference. He's the greatest expert on cats in the world. Uh, but the saber tooth. Well, it makes a difference. Yeah, you, you ought to call them saber tooth. Uh, leave the cat part out because they were saber tooth, all right. But we can't say whether they were saber saber tooth lions, saber tooth uh, tigers, or saber tooth earth a lot. At all cats, of course, if it's satirized, the feeling. But uh, all right, there's enough of that. Thank you, let's go now. No, it's true. <clears throat> it was a fact that these animals had been frozen and preserved for thousands of years, often uh, well enough so they could be eaten. Uh, that uh, not only dogs, but even the uh, Eskimo have often eaten to this uh, uh, state, cut off mammoths that have perhaps been frozen there in the mud of Siberia for 10,000 years. And um, we, there was one of the correspondents of the New York um, Herald Tribune in um, Moscow two years ago, which was uh, like the 
Perhaps that are you telling us that this meat has been frozen for 10,000 years? And fresh, too. Yes, and yet in some cases, just as fresh as it was frozen last They served a whole dinner in St. Petersburg when Benny Grubb spoke to Petersburg to a lot of journalists. I'd like to uh, read a couple of telegrams. Uh, do you want to read that one first, uh, Ben? On. Mr. Hapgood, your theory about the shifting of these crusts under the poles is interesting but unnecessary. For the shifting of the poles themselves is fact, not theory, accurately observed by astronomers for years and charted by the U.S. Hydrographic Office. The other gentleman's telegram is quite clear. The Earth and Moon do revolve about the center of gravity of the Earth Moon system, <coughs> and it's called peregrination. Signed, Bob Smith. <laughs> Any comment, Mr. Hapgood? Yes, uh, the mover that he refers to, that uh, Mr. Smith refers to here, um, is a uh, star space. It's a, it's a small wobble, you might say, of the Earth on its axis of location. Um, it's a piece of stuff in about 14 months, and it uh, has a phase of about 50 feet. Now, that actually was, that was actually predicted. The discovery of this slight wobble of the Earth on its axis was actually predicted by James Clark Maxwell in 1859. And it was discovered the century. Uh, it's not. Of course, uh, it's not the answer to any of the problems that we've been asked, that we've been asking. So we, it, uh, this is small wobble, it's quite true. But, um, it is not explained, I say, just all my information or any of the problems that we're also been concerned. And there's also the, uh, the wandering of the magnetic pole. I wish you'd explain the difference between the, uh, Geodetic pole, the magnetic pole, and the actual axis, actual pole. Mm-hmm. It certainly seems to muddle that issue. Well, uh, of course, bringing in magnetic poles again is something else. The uh, mm-hmm. we know that the magnetic pole, the magnetic north pole, is uh, located about uh, 700 miles, 700 about from the pole, from the north pole. Uh, the South Magnetic Pole is almost but not exactly opposite. But the, um, that brings in the question of the magnetic pole, uh, brings in a very, very large and very technical field. Uh, and it's something that I think is not directly concerned either with our problem. We, um, so, uh, now we're considering them a good deal. As a matter of fact, however, um, this matter of terrestrial magnetism it does come in very much uh, to this question of the shifting crop. Because the Earth's magnetic field is simply most of the uh, specialist field that, that um, the magnetic poles are always been fairly close to the geographical poles, to the axis of rotation. And yet, uh, we find in the rocks, in a good many cases, we find that uh, rocks lined up, let's say rocks laid down in some previous geological period, in which the magnetic particles have been lined up with, uh, uh, with the magnetic field very different from the one that now exists. But after all, uh, many of the rocks that contain those particles of magnetite, they're, they're kind of mineral Iron, many iron, which um, makes them more or less like compass needles. They're very, very tiny. When a rocket is being formed, they, they line up with the magnetic field of the Earth, just like a compass needle. And of course, those um, today, such, uh, such magnetic particles are being lined up uh, with heavy north and south magnetic poles. But now, if you look here back into older, older rocks to find, in a great number of cases in recent years, we have found that, um, for example, rocks in which the magnetic poles of these little rock particles have been pointing east and west on the present Earth's surface. Mm-hmm. We find, for example, a whole series of rocks in England uh, showing uh, indications that the Earth's uh, uh, crust has shifted 
uh, tremendously since the rocks were formed. And as a matter of fact, for oh, oh, the magnetic power shifted. Well, now does the magnetic pole have, have to lie near the actual pole? That's the general opinion of the of the uh, specialists in the United States. Isn't that on the, that that uh, it has? And yes, it has also shifted within quite well. Uh, yeah. And very rapidly has it gone. Yeah. Uh, but it moved about. Uh, since the time they were looking for, uh, wasn't it Franklin who disappeared trying to find the Northwest Passage and all the, the great uh, Canadian expeditions, British expeditions, trying to find him about 100, 100 years ago? Mm-hmm. And the, the magnetic pole at that time was in one position and now it's about, well, about I mean, no good at figures, as you know, but a very considerable distance away from where it was only 100 years ago. Well, the matter is, I. Uh, <coughs> Complicated because there is a regular variation in, mag- in the magnetic uh, pole, and it's a kind of a cycle. And then there was uh, W O R Radio, seven ten on the dial in New York. Some uh, recent uh, investigations indicate that, but but um, the majority, or at least a great number, of those who are are studying this uh, 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 this data. Uh, has come to the conclusion that that the uh, shifts of the Earth's entire crust are very strongly indicated by this field of the data of stress and magnetism. It's one, as a matter of fact, is perhaps the strongest present evidence, evidence for shifts of the crust. Uh, let me interrupt for just a moment to read uh, one other telegram that we have here. This is from Don Griffin. Mr. Griffin must be in New York. Okay. Usually, he sends place in Jersey. Apparently, my assertion of many months back that a man's weight should vary between the equator and the pole did not deserve the ridicule it received in the attempt. Mr. Griffin, I remember that morning. I don't think that anybody ridicules your statement. And I might also say that uh, there's a possibility that there are many people that may not agree with Mr. Hapgood. In fact, Mr. Hapgood, it should be obvious to you, Mr. Griffin, that Mr. Hapgood is not even familiar with the white line of Ecuador. So maybe he could be wrong about the possibility of the difference of weight between the poles and the uh, equator. We've got a couple of other telegrams here, Dave. Do you want to uh, uh, read a couple of these, please? I would like to make another comment on this one. Oh, do you want, I'm sorry. Do you, do you want to continue? Who is this telegram from again? Let me Bob, Bob Smith. Smith. Oh, from Bob Smith, yes. Incidentally, that is not Bob Smith, our program director. Maybe it is, I don't know. All right, I, I'd like to make another comment on the program from Bob Smith. He, say, he says, uh, your theory about the shifting of the crust under the probes is interesting but unnecessary, but the shifting of the probes themselves is fact, not theory. I've commented before uh, on this uh, by saying that this shift that he is referring to is a 50-foot wobble below the 14-month period. But, it, um, but of course, what we're talking about here is a displacement of the Earth's entire crust, not for 50 feet, but for distances up to 2,000 miles. And one of the things that we are trying to set forth, that we're trying to substantiate in this book since the fact that uh, the whole crust of the Earth was displaced for a distance of about 2,000 miles at the end of the ice age. It moved North America, lost in the pole, and moved the Antarctic on it into the Antarctic surface. Dave? Well, here's the telegram. The first one <clears throat> is from Garrison, New York, from Bonnie Carey. Are you familiar with the book, Worlds in Collision, by Dr. Emanuel Velikovsky? If so, will you please discuss the separation of the Red Sea and the world turning in opposite direction on action? <coughs> yes, I'd very glad to make a comment on that. I, uh, <coughs> first, of course, I was uh, much interested in uh, Dr. Velikovsky's book when it first came out. And uh, unfortunately, I had to feel, as most as uh, many others did, that uh, it was unsound 
Um, and so far, it's that it wasn't based on any very careful working out of the laws of physics. He did depend, as he did do, some interesting research in uh, legends and myths. I think some of his bibliographical research was uh, very good and very useful. But um, the basic physical theory didn't hold water, and, and I wasn't able to use it. Now, the next one is from a young lady in Wynwood, Pennsylvania, that asked that her name be withheld. I have read that IGY oceanographers claim there is no basis for belief in the lost continent of Atlantis. Will Mr. Hatwood come? Well, yes. <clears throat> now, I think I mentioned uh, earlier that the uh, new physicists in the 19th century, uh, respected people like George Darwin and uh, George Kelvin, had said that uh, the fifty years old was impossible, that um, continents couldn't be raised or lowered suddenly or at all, really, you know, only very gradually, and so on. And on the basis of this, these geophysical ideas, uh, scientists rejected the whole idea and theory of the, the whole legend of Atlantis that has completely unsubstantiated. You know, the effect, this uh, project of research, which I started out with originally with my students at Springfield College, was really to investigate this and to see whether this, uh, these basic ideas of geophysics were found. And we soon found that they were not. We found that um, the basic ideas of, of uh, George Darwin, Calvin, and the others were based upon the notion, uh, upon the, to be sure, perfectly sound principle that if you shouldn't shift this equator above to the earth, you can't capsize the earth on an axis of rotation without having a really terrific force. <laughs> but, uh, but this does not exclude the idea of shifting the earth's crust. And it turns out that the shifting of the earth's crust today is now widely, it seems to be quite widely accepted. It's accepted by many of the old specialists and terrestrial magnetism that I've just mentioned. It's um, coming to the town of the earth generally looked on rather favorably. Now then, you see, if we follow out the corollaries of the shifting of the crust for the uh, changing of sea levels, and in this book, I've tried very much to follow it quite carefully and see just how shifting of the earth's crust would affect the changes in sea levels uh, and so the elevation of mountain chains uh, and, as a matter of fact, even the big, uh, the, the, the formation of the continent. And we can see here that we now have, in this theory of the shifting of this stuff, uh, it's frequent intervals through time, a very good explanation for the, uh, <coughs> of this, uh, uh, for the sinking of certain islands in the Atlantic Ocean in the last 10,000 years. As a matter of fact, there's some very direct and uh, almost conclusive evidence to sustain this, produced quite recently by a French scientist, Malays, René Malays, uh, who um, uh, brought up from the bottom of the Atlantic, on the Middle Atlantic Ridge, uh, some sediments which contain diatoms of freshwater species in very recent time, um, <clears throat> evidently from a freshwater lake which had existed on the Mid Atlantic Ridge, and within, he thought, the last 10 to 15,000 years. This was the very direct and very strong evidence that the Mid Atlantic Ridge was above the Atlantic as late to the end of the ice age. Of course, there's a great deal of other more evidence. The form of it was presented by Henry Forrest, who wrote a book called The Atlantean Continent. Back uh, in 1920s. He was, um, Michael Forrest was a good zoologist, I believe. And, um, he got interested in the question of the ice age in, uh, England. And in this book, that way, for that 19th continent, Forrest claims that the, the great deal of evidence showing that the great, uh, ice sheet that entered the British Isles actually came not from Scandinavia, but from the northwest, from, uh, therefore, from uh, an ice center in the North Atlantic. 
which he could only do if there was land. He was in the North Atlantic. Well, I became just uh, brought it back to my attention by Stan Rowell, an investigator here in New York, who uh, dug up a lot of interesting information. And he, um, and I went into the original thoughts. I took the, the, the Park book. Uh, went into the original thoughts as far as I could. And it turned out very interesting. I think I found that, that um, much of this was true, that um, there's a great deal of evidence that they actually did come from the Northwest. And they did enter a bridge from the Northwest. And this is more indication of this ransom. But, um, that, of course, is just one, all that is just one very small aspect of the, of the evidence dealing with Atlantis. Uh, Mr. Hapgood, further, in the vicinity of Atlantis, uh, it seems that in the past five years, published, I'm not certain, but I believe it was in the National Geographic, a, a story about a survey, if you might call it that, of the ocean floor of the Atlantic. And it seems that there is a rather long valley that represents a sizable drop-off in the depths of the ocean. And this channel runs in a north and south direction. Have you come across anything concerning this? Yes, it seems to be... <clears throat> There are actually, uh, the first uh, discovery, two or three years ago, was that of what looked like a river system on the bottom of the Atlantic. And it had every chance of things like a river system on land. Uh, the, um, this was traced out by oceanographic uh, specialists from the school university. And uh, it was uh, presented to an interesting point that it's been, it has been debated by geologists. Now, without uh, their reaching any definite conclusion. But uh, it seems as though, and there is a quite a conflict among the geologists as to whether this, this represents uh, a river system once the uh, system above sea level, or whether this was formed by some sort of a marine erosion, a bit of deterrent erosion at the bottom of the sea. I've been going to hear that as far as I could, and I, I, uh, <coughs> I'm not sure just exactly what uh, the meaning of what particular features. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> before the coffee break, you mentioned something about some ex experts coming out of a set of mathematics, which, which you thought at first proved that the uh, the, uh, the equatorial bulge completely offset any 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 uh, any of the centripetal uh, forces you saw in your theory, hopping into the car and, and going out to see Mr. Campbell. And we, we never got around to the answer he gave you. His regard in terms of it was that uh, instead of careening the whole globe, so we just considered it as a possibility of shifting the crust. And it turned out that uh, while shifting, shifting the whole globe would take an impossible amount of force, two times the amount we estimated to be the terms of the ice cap. But the, uh, but, now when we adopted the idea of the shifting of the crust, and then began to work out the mathematics of the physics of France. Uh, we found some very interesting things. I, uh, we found first that the amount, the, the problem was, the shift the earth's crust is not to, it has to be uh, fractured in uh, a number of places. There has to be a fractured process, because when you move across the equatorial bow, it's going to be stretched. Then stretch the crust, move it across the bow. You think that's most least children? Well, if the crust, if the diameter of the Earth is 26 miles longer to the equator than to the poles, if you move a piece of the uh, surface of the Earth, a whole part of the surface of the Earth toward the equator, it, it's going to go over a larger diameter at the equator, and therefore it has to, it will be stretched. And you can't uh, push it. You couldn't push it across the equator without it undergoing fracturing. It's got to be fractured. So then the problem was this. I asked Mr. Campbell to see if he could, if he could um, transform the figure of the total centripetal effect of the ice cap, which was about 7 trillion times metric tons, 
in terms of, of pressure per square foot, per square inch, on the equatorial bars, uh, and so that we could equate that with the uh, strength of the rock of the bar to see whether or not the bursting strength of the, of the rock. Yeah. That was the critical point. That was the necessary thing to do if we were going to be sure that we had a plausible idea. Now, he managed to solve this problem. And we thought, you see, that of 1,728 pounds per square inch, uh, which is the bursting stress on the uh, crust in the bar, the dry bars produced by the present ice cap. Now then, when I, then when I got then, I referenced to the physicist to do the uh, test, laboratory test of the strength, the uh, uh, tensile strength of basalt and granite. We found that 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 that, that tensile strength is approximately uh, the order of 2,000, let's say, uh, pounds per square inch. So that we have, therefore, uh, a splitting force almost equal to the estimated strength. Now, when we talked this matter over with Einstein in Princeton, he made the remark that he would be satisfied if the if the person stress produced by the ice cap was only was as much as one hundred of the estimated strength. One hundred. He'd be satisfied because he said the crust of the earth is very uneven in strength. Yeah. There are the great pictures about the kind of the great volcanic zones, <laughs> and he said uh, the earth crust is unequal in thickness and strength and, and so on, and it's already fractured with the great system of fractures or you know, which has been unknown yeah. hitherto yeah. by well, the Rift Valley. Yeah. Well, wait, for well, which the next thing is offered in the book, yeah. yeah. But um, so he said, he would be satisfied with a ratio of 100 to 1. But what we actually got was a ratio of almost 1 to 1. So we have uh, a person set of 1,700 pounds per square inch. So uh, against an estimated strength of 2,000. Okay. Then you feel the need? No. So that, that's why uh, we would say that then that the theory was, was the, that's the mechanism of the explanation that is plausible from the mathematical and physical and physical standpoint. But even so, uh, we can't say it's true it's by itself. Oh. <laughs> oh. uh, we can't say that this is actual truth, and, and I understand pointed out to us the fact that um, since the, the assumption, he said the only doubtful assumption in the theory, he points out in the forward to the book, the only doubtful assumption in the theory is whether the crust of the earth can be easily enough displaced, whether the um, the south of the past is the fastest convicting of the rock 20 miles down, 40 miles down, is um, sufficient to permit the movement of the crust. This week, cannot know directly because we just cannot get down there. We can't get down there. And we're not sure that we can reach the base of the Yes. So, therefore, we do not know. And uh, Einstein then pointed out that indirectly, from geological evidences, would probably have to be the decisive of factors. Well, I, I've been uh, going, going over the uh, assessment on Mr. Campbell's uh, mathematics and I mean, this is quite, quite plausible. It's quite simple mathematics, too, in parallels and forces. And, uh, as, as, as you say, it's a, it's a description. The, the math is true, but it's actually a description of the mathematics. Ivan, may I try and simplify, uh, Mr. Campbell's mathematics? Yes, please. Well, I most try to, uh, think of Charles' theory and the words that you've been using. These are the people, uh, who are not particularly, specifically interested in this subject. Uh, do you mind, Charles, if I, if I sort of do Not at all. I will, I will, I will try to make it. The uh, whole idea of the, <laughs> the skin of the orange itself moving over the surface of the orange, as it comes to the equator, which is fatter uh, than the Earth, than he uh, looked at in, in any other way, it has to ride up over a mound, as it were. Therefore, it's going to be stretched. What Charles was saying was that the stretching... Uh, which you will have to undergo to get over an extra 26 miles of height. Uh, in other words, it's really going over a mountain as it comes to the equator. Uh, the earth, uh, the skin of the earth can stretch. Rocks are fluid. They take a very long time to move, like treacle, but they will finally move, or like taffy. Um, but, uh, and you can pull them just so far that the strength of them will give way. 
what Charles is saying is the amount they have to stretch is just about equal to the strength of the whole drug. Uh, how can ever at that point there's some horrible things that are going to happen? Because if they give way, something, uh, they're going to crash. And then what's going to happen? Now, this is the other thing that I'd like to point out. Uh, this is a basic matter of Charles' theory. That, as Einstein pointed out, we don't know what's going on 40 miles down or 20 miles down underneath the skin of the, the tiny thin skin of our Earth. The whole theory depends on the fact that the rocks down there, due to pressure and due to heat, you know, uh, if you dig a mine and keep on digging down, first of all, you get rock bursts, you know, they are. The rock oh, will get... I do know. Well, if you go down in a straight mine shaft and you don't shore it up, shore it out, the rock itself will actually burst fly apart due to tremendous pressure and shock. And I know it's rock bursts. Also, the temperature goes up so much per foot as you go down. Uh, mm -hmm. Due to that increased heat and that increased pressure, and heat and pressure are the same anyhow, if you I'm right on that, and they're equivalent, they are the same thing. Um, the well, they have the same effect. Yeah. They have the same effect. Thank you. When you get down for 40 miles, what we call rock, you think of as being absolutely solid, becomes fluid like taffy. Uh, and it is just like taffy, insofar that you can move it, but just so fast. Uh, and then it'll start to break. Now, the idea is that underneath the skin of the earth is that the next layer down can become, under certain circumstances, when it's pushed hard enough, it can become turned from a solid to a fluid, or rather, in its properties, it begins to behave like a fluid. Therefore, you get a sort of scum, liquid scum underneath the skin, so the whole skin should slip. Once it starts to go, to give, the next layer down, is, instead of being absolutely rigid and holding it to the core on one side and to the skin on the other, it becomes fluid and the whole thing starts to slip. Just like when you peel an orange, there is an area between the peel and the surface of the orange itself, which is not quite as solid, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Well, that's what Charles is trying to put in there. Am I putting mm -hmm. it in that? Right, yeah. So yeah. when this corrected skin comes up over the, the bulge of the earth, the tummy of the earth, it's got to go up a, a, a 26 mile mountain, and <clears throat> when it splits and begins to crack, then this liquid, or liquefied rock, comes pouring out from underneath, and that's where you get your great big outflows of what is uh, known as uh, battle, like tremendous volcanic outpouring. Isn't that all right? John, you've got some good things. <laughs> no, no, I just wanted to say, gentlemen, I don't think that we'll have to discuss Atlantis anymore this morning because I just received a telegram from Sunnyside from Irwin Paz. And here's the message. I think it should be of great interest to all of the eight listeners as well as the group sitting around the table this morning. Flying saucers, really cosmic chiropractors, treating Earth for a swim pool. Poor Atlantis died of aging back. <laughs> no, Mr. Hodge, Mr. Hodge, <laughs> that's a great telegram. They really do. Well, I'm sorry to interrupt at this time, gentlemen. The dated uh, back, some of them obviously belong to the Precambrian. And obviously, uh, you can't have uh, some of those seamounts uh, dated much, much farther back than the uh, origin of the moon by the vertebrates there. We're talking this morning with Charles H. Hapgood. That's H A P G O O D. Ellery Lanier, fact editor of Fantastic Science Fiction, is with us. Ben is with the cybernetician. Ivan T. Sanderson, zoologist, and Dave Bell. Mr. Hapgood is the author of the book entitled Earth's Shifting Crust. Dave Bell? The theory that the moon came from the bottom of the Pacific while having been rejected by a number of scientists, nevertheless hasn't been completely exploded. The fact that the uh, bottom 
of the Pacific is still the same material as the remainder of the crust of the Earth wouldn't rule out the idea entirely. Um, consider this possibility that if the Earth's crust had split and that the molten core of the Earth were expelled into space, then the Earth's crust would settle back down and give a reasonably intact uh, surface to the bottom of a cavity which would then fill with water and become a Pacific Ocean. Because of this origin from the uh, molten core of the Earth, and because of the amount of pumice stone that we find present in lava, we can assume that possibly the molten core is constructed or made up of uh, materials very similar to pumice in a uh, molten state. This would account for the pumice stone on the surface of the moon, which is assumed to be there. I don't believe that the theory can be entirely ruled out if you keep in mind this possibility. Now, actually, the thing that I wanted to say earlier was something concerned about the National Geographic, but not concerning this theory. I didn't read February issues. What I wanted to refer to was a, an earlier issue in which they had a complete picture story on the birth of an island, where they showed an island in various steps of being formed in the Pacific Ocean having raised up from the uh, from the uh, bottom of the ocean. I haven't, I wonder if you remember having seen that article. For the British. Uh, for the British. Hopped up and down about uh, ten times. <coughs> and this is close enough. He comes up and says, Does anyone you live you? on it? Hmm? No. People have done from time to time. There's a lot of bird guana there. Uh, it was 400 foot high and 17 something, and then the next time it wasn't there at all, and then it was only 40 foot high, and then it was uh, 20, 200 foot deep, and it popped up again. It's, it's a fascinating story that was written up in the, uh, in the National Geographic for some years about six How long did people live there when they did? Well, they come and go, you know. Um, transient. I don't think anybody's ever actually seen it go, uh, go up or go down. Mm -hmm. so in the other days, it's just. Uh, from popping up into the theory, and you know, they were very bad with their charts in those days, and they thought they might have just missed it. Also, we missed Corsi about 40 miles from our wall, so we were on the map in the wrong place. Full of footy in the middle of the Pacific, you know, too much. John, if I may take a moment, I, I think I can explode your, your theory. Um, one rather simple Not way. No, uh, um, Dave. Dave. Uh, yeah, right. my theory. Uh, no, no, no. It's your show, John. <laughs> I've uh, so far to rough. May I correct you? It isn't my theory. No, but the one you were mentioning. And, and I don't remember all the details about it. I was trying to recall them as I was going along, and I was having a little difficulty because of Ben heckling. No. I wasn't heckling. You can't <laughs> say you heard me heckling. Ask the chap who developed the theory. Uh, um, about this point, uh, do you know any animal or any living thing on the surface of this earth that can live perpetually uh, below zero centigrade or above 100 degrees centigrade? Um, if, if you say you don't, I'll tell you because I can tell you one that there are certain kinds of fly larvae that can live in water, which is actually boiling, and others which can live in pure gas. Uh, apart from that, on the whole, life has to be confined between. Um, freezing and boiling. Now, if you start splitting the middle of the, what used to be, what is now the Pacific, open and uh, letting a lot of magma pour out of there uh, at a temperature of what, 4,000 centigrade or something, 4,000, um, that's going to boil everything on the surface of the Earth. And just uh, the amount of time to let the moon loose, like a sort of bursting boil out of the side of the, of the, the mother planet would so heat up the surface of this planet that it must have destroyed the whole of life as we know it today. 
Now, there is no such destruction of life at any time during the complete geological record. It's gone on continuously from the beginning. It started with, with amino acids and build up to amoebas to make it oversimplified and end up with uh, people like us. Uh, but uh, uh, you can't just sort of cut it all off with the dinosaurs and then have them all start again with dinosaurs. You can start right at the bottom. Now, there is no, there's no complete clean cut in the history of the Earth in pre-Cambrian time. Now, if, if this gentleman theory is that the moon sort of squirted out of the center of the Earth prior to the beginning of life on the surface of the Earth, or uh, in very much pre-Cambrian time, that uh, is an entirely different matter. But uh, that brings us right back to the, the present theory, I think, is that we are a, a binary planet in the first place. Right. Right? Twin planets, one big one and one little one. Uh, they had, you had the centrifugal force there, and just like the Antarctic today, with a bigger lump on one side than on the other, uh, it finally broke, and you got a little one going around the big one, which is us. And as I see Charles is getting nervous now, he's got something to say on that. Uh, no, I don't want to interrupt you. I'm going to interrupt you, but uh, in this, because, but um, that's a fascinating uh, uh, theory on, on the planetary origin, so uh, we've been discussing that. But uh, I just want, but in this. Uh, my main objection to the um, I sort of uh, sidestep the question of the origin of the moon in the Pacific is uh, really because it doesn't explain enough. It's because uh, we assume that that happened back in the Mesozoic, say, 300 million years ago. Uh, this will not explain what's happened on the Earth since that time. Can I explain the um, case of the United States? It will not explain the ice cap in We're talking this morning with Charles H. Hapsgood, that's H-A-P-G-O-D, author of the book entitled Earth Shifting Crust. And uh, we have Ellery Lamb there with us, fact editor of Fantastic Science Fiction. I don't know how he's going to have a fact yet. <laughs> Well, you they probably write, write herd on the others, you know. Don't get too long. That is, that is with us. He's started the division. Robert Sanderson, the zoologist, and Dave Bell. On the one hand, you're, um, you have to, the disappearance of a great continent, the ice capping off, and that's a one thing that's square miles. You're going to say, that. Uh, you have to assume a very, uh, a very, a very active force. And the only one thing they could account for of melting the one ice cap and most of the other thing, that would be very, uh, about the only reason for one that would be a Gentlemen, I have a couple of more telegrams here. This is one from Pete McLaughlin, Tropic Garden, Quakertown, Pennsylvania. I don't think he's listening to me. I think he's listening to Big Joe's Happiness Exchange because he says, I think you're real hot tonight. <laughs> We're talking about <laughs> our <laughs> <laughs> Here's another telegram. This is for you, uh, Mr. Hapgood. Please ask Mr. Hapgood comment on hydrogen bombs in Arctic ice possibly to inundate our Atlantic seaboard. This is from Emil Osman of Lindhurst, New Jersey. Well, one of the perhaps <coughs> questions perhaps is um, how, in case uh, the Antarctic ice cap is threatening uh, us with a new shift to the crust, which would be quite like the right path of civilization, uh, what should we do about it? And Mr. Brown, who's uh, suggested this was in the first place, is uh, it was suggested that perhaps with uh, nuclear power, we might be able to melt the Antarctic ice cap uh, and, and thereby prevent uh, this, uh, this cataclysm from happening. So uh, he devoted a very lot of time to it, and I devoted some time to it too, but uh, a, a very intricate question because this ice cap covers six million square miles. To melt it would require quite a lot of atomic bombs, and the question is, wouldn't they so poison the air that uh, we would all be stimulated by the radioactive bombs, you see? So we would have to find some way of using the nuclear power to control the ice gap. We have to remember the right places 
uh, without poison uh, the population of the year. That's for a problem for somebody else. I I know I've asked the, the president and uh, <coughs> uh, the National Security Council, perhaps. Right. That. We're talking this morning with Charles H. Hapgood, that's H-A-P-G-O-D, author of the book entitled Earth Shifting Crust. And uh, we have Ellery Land there with us, fact editor of Fantastic Science Fiction. I don't know how he's going to have a fact editor of <laughs> <laughs> Fiction Magazine, but... Well, he probably writes right, right, right heard on the others, you know. Don't get too long. That is with us. He's Savage and Dickens. Robert E. Savage and Zoologist. And Dave Bell. Ellery Lanier. Um, Mr. Hutz and Charles, I have a small global bone to pick with you on your theories, which I, I admire your theories very much. I think they're quite important, and I, I think your book is an important book. The United States has had some sort of disastrous earthquakes. We've had a San Francisco earthquake which is very destructive. And uh, it's my personal opinion that some of the theories that you outline in this book may help us to understand the nature of earthquakes and uh, prevent these tremendous disasters that have occurred at times. The bone I have to pick with you is uh, your reference to a certain, uh, I don't know if he's a theologist, the name of Bird Cook, who you refer to in your text. And for the record, I want to, I think, I mean, I just talked to one book where you state that uh, since truth cannot be suppressed forever, and they should be shown, uh, to explain why the theory should be expounded, even though there are lots of who are not awake and you know, want to stay in the past and they're still living with their beggars and so on. Uh, Birthwood's notion of a collision of the Earth with a small planetoid that existed is John. And I think that uh, John is extremely important. Whether, uh, I don't know whether John really exists or whether John doesn't exist. I do not know. But in any case, according to the theory, John, John was the second most important planet in the solar system is to the Earth. And without the influence of John, life would never have come about on Earth. In your book, you refer to the theory of the moon coming out of the Pacific, and you uh, state that the argument has been written away. I'm not sure if it's been recorded and written John away so easily, because according to Earth, it was the uh, the caused by John's massive the Earth that caused the Earth to speed up and bulge out of the equator and give birth to the moon. And in the process, uh, how very important the fact the emergence of man is and eventually man. Uh, this, my reference to the planet John is for the record. I don't think it should be forgotten. I think you should know about John. But I, I would like very much to know why you the John so fascinating. Well, uh, of course, I brought in uh, Burgess uh, on purpose because I didn't want to have him On the one hand, uh, the government was talking to him to be along the line that I was following. On the other hand, I thought it was rather interesting. I, I thought it uh, was your, your theory. I found in the writing version that you had a similar thought. Yes, uh, that he felt that a, an apparent, that a uh, collision could have caused a, a movement to be a thrust. Uh, that it might have caused such a certain movement to be placed into the thrust. And then he, I think, also, he even argues that the North Pole has been a good way of thereabouts. And that the thrust is actually a case of collision. Well, I think that's a major collision. It's not with John, at least with George, or some other uh, uh, planet or planet uh, does. I have a question with John. I'm sorry, I couldn't agree with you, George. Well, it's the same place. 
I need to see your film. Uh, I know that, uh, now, Dr. Urey, you see that, uh, and it's about something of the same, you know, uh, line of thought. You spoke on the planet, uh, the origin, uh, the origin of the planet. You spoke of Urey, uh, how of Urey. Um, he grew up the idea that, uh, Dr. Me- we also know, for example, uh, some of the Soviets, uh, the main expeditions in the Arctic, so, shown in recent years by this, uh, that uh, the whole Arctic Ocean has originated since the Mesozoic period. That is, it's, uh, it, it, it actually, uh, the, the whole, uh, uh, that Arctic Ocean is a, is a recent development. Now, nothing was ripped out of the Arctic Ocean. We have to account for the creation of the Arctic Ocean in some other way. It's a recent development on the Earth's surface, and it has to be explained, but it can't be explained by looking out a moon, because we already have a moon, you see, and we can't, we've got a moon from the Pacific, and so on. So, um, you know, there's too much to be explained, uh, and we can't uh, put it all on just one moon, not one ocean. Well, this great idea of the difference between an ocean and uh, the essence of an ocean, um, the oceans are on average two and a half miles deep, and two and a half miles out of 40 miles from the crust alone is absolutely nothing. And now we're beginning to find that the, uh, the surface of the bottom of the ocean is covered with the same stuff as the land. Uh, we are also beginning to find that whole sections of the bottom of the rise up in a matter of hours. I don't know if you know the case, uh, which was quoted by Spence, the famous expert, and he was an expert on, on uh, Atlantis. As a matter of fact, he lost his whole reputation. I don't have to do Charles of Lyon. Um, mm-hmm. I think he told me about that one. In, in a book, uh, John, um, about Atlantis, uh, Herbert Spence, wasn't it? Right? Right. He, he started, uh, very based, that is, his whole conclusions on one thing. That was the sudden splitting of the cable between Cape Town, South Africa, and St. Helena. Um, and that's when he stated that when the cable ship had been sent there, they fish up the cable from one end until they come to the brain, they found that the ocean bottom had risen one and three-quarter miles overnight. And he published this statement, and he was called, immediately called on it. And he had got it from a clipping sent to him by a perfectly reputable scientist from an American newspaper, and they could never trace it. It just so happened that I spent two years uh, digging back, and we did finally find it in a perfectly reliable publication by the name of Zodiac, which is the uh, house organ, the technical house organ of what used to be the Eastern Union, not Western Union, the Eastern Union. And in this uh, this publication, there is a definite statement uh, as to what exactly happened. And I think it's very significant to Charles' theory and also to Ellery's uh, remarks here. There, the British Admiralty had surveyed the area on the way to, to South Africa from the island of St. Helena. In, I, I'm, as you know, after the usage on page, John, let us say in 1900. And they had found that the ocean bottom there was uh, two and a half miles deep. Uh, it's just about what it was throughout that, uh, that area. And they had laid the cable uh, with that understanding. And the cable had worked for a considerable number of years. And then all of a sudden, it broke. And they sent the cable ship, the name of it, as a matter of fact, was the Britannia. And she fished it up and took soundings at the same time and found that a strip of ocean bottom, 200 and some odd miles long, and it's at the widest point, 25 miles wide, and its narrowest point, 10 miles wide, had risen one and three quarter miles. Uh, more or less, apparently, overnight. Now, the, speed, the average of the ocean bottom is only two and a half miles. <laughs> They've only got about a mile to go. They can come up a mile and, more than a mile in one night. The ocean bottom, which is only a mile deep, could suddenly appear as land. Therefore, the actual difference between an ocean and the absence of an ocean is not really as great as we previously thought. Now that we know that the, the skin of the earth goes down underneath and up again, mm-hmm. I think you might be interested in this. 
I was just talking to Al Nielsen, our engineer, and Al told me that this afternoon he was reading his National Geographic dated to February 1958. And there's an article in there about this theory of the possibility of the moon uh, having been a part of this planet. Now, if this theory has been exploded, why would it be in what uh, I imagine could be considered a fairly current edition of National Geographic? Well, a theory can go on forever, John. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, mean, I realize that, but in other words, if it's completely exploded, in other words, that, that there's, there's nothing to this, uh, why would a publication like National uh, Geographic uh, print it? Well, but what did it say, John? Do you have to go... What well, it's it, it, Yes, it's discussed. I haven't read it. Al Nielsen, I Yeah, well, I mean, here, uh, read it. Yes. The, the article might have said that uh, they might be simply discussing a theory which was at one time put forward without saying that they agree with it. Mm. Oh, I, I don't. I have evidence for it, or new evidence against it. I don't mean to imply that National Geographic that behind this idea. Come out for the idea. No, I don't think that could happen. No, uh, but there, the explanation. I think one thing we should say uh, is the guy who thing like that. Um, there's a tremendous lag, very very slow uh, process of circulation of fire. Uh, of data and of uh, theories too, uh, is, uh, so that some of the old theories last for a terrible length of time. Now, for example, uh, one of the most interesting things which I discovered when I began this work was I found that um, there was a change in the uh, theory of the origin of the Earth, and that this theory, originally, we saw it as being originally a molten mass that just cooled off and solidified, which is sort of uh, uh, never a theory of the Earth's origin. And that had been universally accepted down to about 30 years ago. Now then, by, by 30 years ago, in fact, about 1900, or after that, Chamberlain and Southern uh, of it developed the Panatensional Theory. And from that time on, it became more and more obvious that this never a theory wouldn't work, and that the moon that the Earth had never been molten. Uh, 30 years ago, with that, most of the geologists, many of the geologists, uh, it's been unanimous that accepted this. I, 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 I'm not going to ask you several of them, but many of them have. And then, um, by ten years ago, the majority of geophysicians had given up the idea. But, uh, George Gamow, his biographer of the Earth, published just a few years ago, reproduced the same idea of a uh, remote knowledge of the Earth, and without even suggesting the possibility that, that it ever had been questioned. And today you will find many geologists as well as the general public who will hold their own theory, although really it was exploded at least 30 years ago. You mean the, the nebula? Yeah. And then you'll see about this the matter of the moon coming out of the Pacific, and one other piece of evidence that is rather important here is that um, in the last 10 years we've discovered hundreds of sea mounts on the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. These are our flat-topped mountains that rise from the bottom of the Pacific and are cut off at the different distances below the surface. Some of them rise to within half a mile of the surface. Some of them rise to within three or four miles of the surface. But they have to mention, we'll explain it one time, one time, and then start to explain all the mountain formations that's been going on, you see, in the last hundred of years. In other words, it doesn't tell us enough. If it has, uh, whether it's right or whether it's wrong, still doesn't explain. I would like to say one thing about this, um, uh, that I consider the most important point about this, say, that we're trying to present in this book. Uh, uh, Mr. Campbell, the nominee, and I'm about to say, the thing about this is, um, a, what we might call it general. It's a generalized hypothesis. It's intended to explain a great many different the breakfast uh, theory will explain certain facts, the new theory explains certain facts, and so on. This uh, is 710 on the dial, WOR Radio, New York City. These are the facts over here, the point of the zero facts over there. But you know, we're trying to make a pattern or explanation for, uh, that will connect perhaps a hundred major, different major problems in the earth. Uh, to the earth. It's a generalized way of the earth. I mean, so we're going to explain not only 
Well, say, I say, too. The one polar climber. And the mountains are making the folded mountains, and block mountains, and volcanic mountains, and so forth. And this condition of thinking to the origin and shape of the continents, and uh, the cause of the heat of the earth, and uh, about 50 other problems. And of course, we're falling right into the danger of being accused of uh, presenting the gnostic in our terror. You know, the medicine, the driver's side medicine that will, uh, that will cure everything, including uh, amputated foot and so on. Um, you're a very good You see, the medicine is, well, no, this is the book really, well, the really, uh, hope it's scientific. It still does explain so much that we're exposed to that occupation. We're trying to cure everything. Because we've got to hear an answer to uh, perhaps or to so many different problems. You're referring to your book? Yeah. The Earth Shifting Cut. Yes. It's, um... <clears throat> the man who wrote the index of this book was, uh, if I tell a fellow, and, um, he made them think quite thoroughly when he wrote it, when he wrote the index, and he used the index as a means of arguing for the theory. And one of the uh, items in the index uh, was uh, uh, the displacement of, under this heading, we have practically a summary of the whole book, and this about 50 or 60 major, major uh, problems that are solved by this, this one, one theory. Uh, ben, you had a brief question there? Yeah, I, I would like to ask Mr. Hapkett, uh, uh, simplifying your, your theory, sort of, the explanation for the ice agent is that the, the ice didn't roll down to meet us, but that the uh, North American continent shifted over into the, uh, into the, uh, near the North Pole, and this, this, and this formed the great, uh, hip, worm, and rungle glaciations? No, the different glaciations were formed by different displacements. In other words, it's run structure this way, you have an ice cap. Yeah, yeah. And here, as it moves again in another direction, you have an ice cap somewhere else. Yeah. Each of the major glaciations then was the result of the displacement of the crust, leaving a certain area at what, the nearest pole. Yeah, well, what about the uh, these so-called glaciated rocks that uh, strewn over the North American continent are these gigantic boulders? in relatively non-rocky areas and, uh, say, a, a gigantic boulder or a certain kind of mineral that is uh, uh, hundreds of miles away from any deposit of this kind of mineral. And previous to this, the explanation has been that these gigantic boulders, I think there are quite a few of them all over Vermont, were brought down with the, uh, with the glaciers uh, during the ice age. Is that the only explanation for why these tremendous rocks and boulders, which are completely unlike the mineral deposits around the surrounding countryside who came down actually on in the uh, rocks that were torn up by the glacier. <clears throat> yeah. How, well, I mean... That's completely right. We, we, uh, certainly, uh, we don't question that. that <coughs> is, well, how would, that how would this... That is, that way. That is, of the, out of the ice cap, the ice cap grew in North America because America was moving toward the pole at the time. But uh, the ice cap itself, as it moves, big enough to move by gravity, of course, it... It could uh, have the glacial movement to face. This is precisely as the spatial geologists uh, have, have stated it, you see. We're talking this morning with Charles H. Hapgood. That's H-A-P-G-O-O-D, the author of the new book entitled Earth's Shifting Crust. Crust, I'm sorry might also add that I've had a number of letters during the week, some 15 or 16 letters from people who suggested that we should have Mr. Hapgood with us this morning, and I'm very happy that Ivan T. Sanderson was kind enough to read. Ellery Landier is with us, fact editor of Fantastic Science Fiction, and it's with Ivan T. Sanderson and Dave Bell. <laughs> Pardon me. Here's a telegram from R. Gladstone, Jamaica. It is my understanding that the latest theory concerning the moon and the earth involves the idea that both bodies are of independent planets revolving around a common center of gravity 
located somewhere in the earth. Kindly discuss this. This is from Carold, K E W R O L D, Carold R. Gladstone of Jamaica, New York. Don't you read it again, please? Yes, sir. It is my understanding that the latest theory concerning the moon and the earth involves the idea that both bodies are of independent planets revolving around a common center of gravity located somewhere in the earth. How can the earth revolve around a center of gravity located within the earth? Gentlemen, I am reading a telegram from Mr. Gladstone. Uh, well, the binary theory of this book, I never heard about the center of gravity being in the Earth, or a common focal point. Yeah. Five Yeah. It's a question of definition. No, it's a question of place. I mean, the common yeah. focal point around which the moon and the Earth revolve is somewhere between them. It's not in the Earth. It's the center of gravity of the whole system. Well, but the telegram speaking says, oh, I, uh, it is my understanding yeah. that the latest theory concerning the moon and the earth involves the idea that both bodies are of independent planets revolving around a common center of gravity located somewhere in the earth. In other words, if the, if the moon being smaller and if it should be so very much lighter uh, relative to the uh, that, that that point might be within the surface of the earth. Is everybody May I suggest this, gentlemen? There is a possibility that uh, this is, is certainly not clear. Mm -hmm. This is uh, the result of many collisions with large uh, planetoids. And that these high are there uh, because uh, they were created by the collision. And that. Uh, with our guest, Ellery Lanier, who is the fact editor of Fantastic Science Fiction, has been talking about Professor Berquist and his theory. I was just wondering, uh, Ellery, if you want to continue, would you care to add something, share with more something about this moon or the dinosaurs? I don't know what it was all about, but evidently it's Professor Berkowitz's theory, and possibly you agree with it. It would be possible to prove Berkowitz's theory if when our uh, rockets arrive on the moon and some digging is done, skeletons of dinosaurs will be dug up on the moon's surface. This would prove Berkowitz's theory. Did they survive the trip? 
Well, the question is, some of them may have survived. The skeletons may have been trapped, and somehow a few may have uh, gotten through. Well, we might, of course, on the other hand, uh, we might, uh, didn't we might discover some of these, we might be able to find that uh, it's really quite a different story, that with the dinosaurs that uh, haven't been dropped off there on the way from some other planet, you know. Well, that's uh, that is uh, I'd like to ask if you had a I don't know, if uh, the whole of southern Sweden has made a punishment. I don't think so. It's too much different. The Berkowitz theory is that uh, when the moon was uh, ripped off the... Yeah, uh, yeah, I got the theory. Uh, Excuse me, but... Uh, various bits and spatters and watches of this ripped off moon fell back in yeah, the long... Yeah, the best of our knowledge, the surface of the moon is made of punishment. And uh, therefore, it's a bit that it fell back in southern Sweden. The whole of uh, southern Sweden must be made of punishment. And also, I'd like to know what happened to the skin of the earth, which must have gone off with the blob went to the moon because the, the, the surface yes. of the of the, uh, the underneath mm -hmm. of the Pacific is made of exactly the same stuff as the surface of all the continents and the surface of the underneath of all the other oceans. So if somebody ripped a huge great hunk out of one side of the globe yes. and sent it uh, sailing out into the sky, it must have taken some of the skin with it. Where did all this new skin come from? Exactly. Uh, that was uh, holes, and uh, I, I, I don't know whether I'm not holding for Berkowitz, I'm just uh, presenting his uh, theory that uh, there are these, the, uh, what he calls a CO and the CION, uh, you know the pronunciation better than I knew of that, yes, 20 years and, ago. Uh, yes, and that the uh, fact is that the surface skin of the earth that is prevalent all over the world is not present in this in the basin of the Pacific Ocean, according to Berkowitz. Well, according to him, but according to uh, uh, Professor Haley and all of us mentioned findings of the uh, Task Force 43 and the Antarctic Expedition and the worldwide surveys of uh, what the Dutchman then made, I never can pronounce his name, um, that it is yes, the um, same all over the bottom of the, uh, of the Pacific. Uh, the old idea of CL and CMAR is gone completely, and they have discovered now that they used to I, think I that I the bottom of the ocean yeah, yeah. was covered by a silicon magnesium rock. And that the uh, the continents are made of silicon and aluminum for the most part, Rob. So they find that it's not so. Now, when they've taken these core borings and all over the Pacific, not all over, but uh, very extensively, they have never yet found any place where there is not the CL, the CL as well as the CMAR. Uh, there is a preponderance of uh, basaltic outflows. That's basalt. That stuff comes down yeah. low. But uh, there is no difference. Now, this theory that, that Mr. Quist, or whatever his name is, has. Uh, is the theory of Sir Charles Darwin, not not uh, the original Charles Darwin, but his son, I think I'm right. No, George. Uh, George, I George, think it's yeah. right. George. Is that not right, Charles? George Darwin, yes. He tried to develop the theory of, of the moon having originated from the Pacific. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> I think it will there, be a there are, there are, are proven it's so nice. It's been very happily <laughs> proven. <laughs> well, <laughs> There is there have been a number of uh, of objections to this uh, advanced by geophysicists um, in recent years. Gutenberg, you know, uh, Gutenberg, as you've answered a good many uh, in a book of, of his on the internal constitution of the Earth. But uh, my my feeling is then that one such thing as the uh, one great event, such as zipping out. Uh, the moon out of the Pacific is not a good enough explanation for the uh, all the things that have happened through the whole history of the Earth. It's been putting too much, you see, upon this one hypothetical event. We're putting too much of a burden on one hypothetical event. It also seems almost impossible to conceive of such a thing as that occurring and still leaving the dinosaurs or any other mammals uh, on the face of the Earth. But you think of the, of the meteorological effects of uh, ripping out of the continent out of the Pacific in that way. The possibility of uh, any life remaining on the face of the Earth in those circumstances would be almost uh, out of the question. It seems too much. It's too much to... to uh, it seems an improbable thing. Now, I don't say it's not true, and I don't say it's impossible, but I say it's, it seems improbable, and that it can't... It isn't enough but to explain... Are uh, the innumerable things that uh, have happened to uh, more than two billion years that we know of in their history? But let me ask them something. For example, just a moment, about yeah. that matter of the ice ages. 
Now, you can't explain ice ages from the Cambrian to uh, the shift due to either vertical collisions or to uh, the uh, creation of the Pacific. Uh, 